Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to U.S. History Through Film. Uh, as we talk a little bit about a couple of the battles of Calpins uh, and Guilford Courthouse in the South. Because after the defeat of Ferguson at Kings Mountain, Cornwallis had to turn back toward the coast, and Loyalists were much less willing to openly support the Crown. Indeed, some, um, including Theodore Roosevelt and Thomas Jefferson, have described Kings Mountain as the turning point of the war, at least a turning point of the war in the South. Give it credit for keeping the southern colonies independent. Um, and some have made the same or a similar claim for a battle that took place just a few months later at Calpin, South Carolina. There, the American commander, um, Daniel Morgan, um, who played a great role in the victory at Saratoga with his sharpshooters um, at Freeman's Farm, he uh, took advantage of the British prejudice um, against militia. He lined up his militia in the front of the battle ordered them to fire two shots and then retreat, as if they were running away. Uh, so the British chased them, luring them into a trap. Because behind the militia um, were regular soldiers from the U.S. Army and some militia who had a significant amount of professional experience already. Um, and as the British forces ran into those more experienced troops, um, fighting got serious. The militia then returned, attacked the British from the, from the side, um, and cavalry moved around from the rear, um, where they'd been concealed behind some trees in a low hill, to attack the British from behind. A perfect double envelopment, um, completely surrounding the British forces. Um, and most of the British forces were, uh, were trapped. Some, including um, Bannister Tarleton himself, managed to escape. Um, and after heavy hand-to-hand -hand fighting, uh, cavalry saber to cavalry saber in the woods. But this, um, this new victory over more Loyalist forces and British forces in the South um, can weaken Loyalist support for the British further and um, convince Cornwallis he had to move back towards the coast as his western flank was no longer secure. And General Greene um, decided to lead Cornwallis on a wild goose chase as they did it, moving rapidly, launching small raids against Cornwallis to force him to respond. But Corn Green was moving so quickly, Cornwallis had to um, burn most of his wagons uh, and supplies to let his men move faster. He did finally catch up with Green at Guilford Courthouse, North Carolina, where Green uh, again set his men up in three lines, much as Morgan had done at Calpin's although spread further apart because it was a larger force and he wanted to make sure he could protect his flanks. However, he separated his men a bit too much. They couldn't easily support each other the way Morgans had done at Cowpens. And while Cornwallis was outnumbered, he marched his men across an open field toward militia in the woods and, sh and men sheltered behind rail fences. Their rifles let them shoot down the British soldiers before the British, with their muskets, could easily return fire. But eventually got close enough to fire and then fight their way through the woods, although taking terrible losses along the way. The British then attacked the second and even third lines of the Continental Army. The militia retreated, but um, American cavalry charged to hold off the British and cover the retreat of the other forces, at which point Cornwallis ordered his artillery to fire grape shot, you know, small round balls, um, kind of like a large shotgun, um, meant to kill as many soldiers as possible, um, ordered his artillery to fire grape shot into the midst of the fighting, killing American and British soldiers alike. At which point, Green's army retreated, but Cornwallis's army was too worn out to follow. Although technically a British victory, it was a very costly one. Cornwallis lost about a quarter of his forces, and began moving toward the coast for resupply and reinforcement. And the battles of Calpins and Guilford Courthouse are depicted and, in a way, combined in the movie The Patriot. Now, The Patriot was released in the year 2000, shows a highly fictionalized version of the Revolutionary War in the South. Now, it was filmed entirely in South Carolina, where most of the action is set. The costumes were researched very well to be accurate. Most of the main characters are fictional. All of the main hero and the main villain are loosely based on historical figures 
and a few historical people do appear. And a lot of the stories exaggerated or outright invented, although uh, indeed to such an extent there were significant complaints in Britain, particularly from the descendants of the man upon whom the main villain was loosely based, and the city of Liverpool demanded a formal apology, although I think they didn't get one. The main character in the movie, of which um, I'm only recommending you watch a small clip, although you can certainly watch the whole thing if you have it available. The main character is Benjamin Martin, a French and Indian War veteran and a South Carolina farmer. He's fictional but loosely based on the Swamp Fox and other guerrilla leaders, um, particularly Thomas Sumter, a man nicknamed the Carolina Gamecock. He's also based on the great sharpshooter and hero of Saratoga and Calpins, General Daniel Morgan. Now, one big complaint about the movie, and this is from some, a part we will not be, be watching, um, is that while African Americans are shown working on Martin's farm, he makes a point of saying they are free men working for pay, which seems very unlikely in South Carolina in the 1770s, and is different from the men he's based on who were slave owners. The principal villain is Colonel, Colonel William Tavington, um, an officer of British Dragoons very loosely based on Bannister Tarleton, um, the English commander of the British Legion, which had been a mixture of cavalry and infantry, almost all of them American Loyalist volunteers, with a distinctive green jacket, not the red coat shown in the movie. In the movie, he's a real monster, guilty of numerous war crimes, and all the man he's based on was ruthless and possibly guilty of some war crimes, most notably massacring soldiers trying to surrender at the Waxhaws, he was not the monster shown in the movie. Nor did he come to the end they show in the movie. He survived the war, returned to England, and lived a long life, eventually being elected a member of Parliament for Liverpool. And General Lord Charles Cornwallis um, is a historical character appearing in the movie. He was considered a great British general, um, although Washington had already defeated him in the Battle of Princeton. And the movie depicts him reasonably accurately. Um, although certainly not completely. After the Revolutionary War, incidentally, he served as Governor General of India, where he expanded British control over local rulers, and as Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, which he helped to officially make a theoretically equal part of the United Kingdom. He then went back to India, where he died of fever and is buried, although there is a memorial to him in one of the great cathedrals um, in, of England, um, I forget if it's St. Paul's Cathedral or Westminster Abbey, and it mentions many parts of his long uh, military career, but not his time in America. In the movie The Patriot, um, the Battle of Calpins is presented as one of two climatic battles in the movie. Um, all the battle, as they depict it, um, really combines elements of both the battles of Calpins and of Guilford Courthouse, again, which were pretty similar battles in some ways. It also contains many fictional elements. It does have the common element of militia forces firing two shots and then retreating, pulling the British into a trap. It includes that element from the Battle of Guilford Courthouse of Cornwallis ordering his cannons to open fire in the middle of the battle, hitting both American and British soldiers. And after that battle, the movie um, briefly but fairly accurately describes the Battle of Yorktown. So if you have the movie at home, um, I'd recommend starting at 2 hours, 15 minutes, and 50 seconds in. Um, or, of course, you're welcome to watch the entire movie, which is very entertaining and has a lot of good points, um, and a lot of pretty wildly fictional ones as well.